everyone. Welcome to the show. Paul Charchian in today. Both, it's the rare situation where both JG and Dan Barrero are out. I believe yesterday, Alec Lewis made his his first ever hosting effort on this station, right? Yeah, nine to noon. It was nine me, it was YA and MF, me, right. and me and young Alec. That's super cool. It That's was a lot of fun, cool. man. Uh, did he soil himself? <laughs> no, he actually surprisingly wasn't very nervous walking really? in. Really? And I was uh-huh. like, really? I'm like, I do this every day and I'm still nervous, <laughs> man. And then I th- it kind of hit him a little bit in that first segment, I think. But yeah. he, he, did, he, was, he handled it like a pro, man. He's yeah. awesome. That was great. Good for him. I'm excited for his development. It's uh, uh, it's this is this is drive time. This is a big deal. Yeah. Normally, Dan Barrero, the juggernaut of drive time, in this spot. Paul Charging with you today. Boy, do we have some great guests lined up today. Coming up later in this show, Thor Nystrom, fantasy football weekly co-host and draft expert, will talk about the Vikings, what they may do at pick eleven and twenty-three. We're going to talk to Lindsey Whalen, 4 o'clock. Hey, look yeah. at that. Let's get some HOF women's basketball immortality on the show. Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, Iowa LSU. Did you watch any of that last Oh, yeah. Last it, was, night? it was appointment television. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I literally ran up my stairs just so I could make sure to get home in time. I pulled it up on my bootleg website on my phone just so I wouldn't <laughs> miss a second. <laughs> You can't say that on the air, <laughs> no, man. Yeah, it's, it's a bit. Oh. Um, so many great things about that game. We're going to dive deep into both games. We'll dive deep into that. I think especially the first one, second one too, because we love Paige Beckers here. Yeah. So obviously, you know, and the next, the next matchup is going to be even bigger than this one potentially, which is um, insane. Which is insane. And one of the great things about the games last night, the downtime between games was. I don't know. A minute? Right. I mean, it was awesome. We went out Just of the end of the right first from one right, to the next. And they're tipping off. Oh, that was great. It was beautiful. I and then the that. halftime show was even great. John Krasinski, 430. We'll talk Timberwolves primarily. Um, I assume he will also want to chime in on some of the women's hoop stuff. I'm assuming he watched it. Uh, Houston coming up tonight. Wolves need to rebound off of the... Really disappointing loss to the Bulls after the gigantic win in Denver. And then you just hand back a victory to the rest of the the rest of the division or conference. We'll talk about uh, the Wolves, the importance of this game and how you really don't want to be sitting in the three seed where the Wolves are now. Because as it stands, that's the Pelicans and that's a matchup I do not want. No, not one bit. Then. Representative Pat Garofalo will get the latest on the sports gambling legalization effort at the Capitol with Pat. And at 535, Matt Waldman. He is the proprietor, owner of the Rookie Scouting uh, Portfolio. We'll talk to him about uh, a variety of different rookie-related topics and draft topics. So just tons of stuff to get into. And we've got Ode Ode to a Dead Guy that almost nobody will see coming. Oh. It's a... It's sort of a second tier ode to a dead guy, Max. Uh, that will uh, that has importance to me, and but is surrounding this person is a remarkable amount of notable names and success, and we'll talk about him a little bit later in the show. All right, so you watched the game last night, absolutely. Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese. Now, when these teams met last year. That was the most watched women's basketball game. Of all time, 9.5 million viewers tuned in. I think they said it's more than most NBA playoff games that, as well. That would probably more than me. the finals itself. Yes. So I've not seen, have you seen any of the viewership numbers from last night? I have not seen those. I've been Googling it, trying to find if we've got, if there's any new data on this, because you'd think somebody would want to be trumpeting this. Maybe it's worse news than I th- could, than I thought, but I don't. I don't think it's going to be based no. on what I was seeing through social media. This is what everybody was watching. LSU, Iowa. Now, did you have a rooting interest going into this game? No, I kind of just wanted a good game. I just was hoping that it was a good game and that it lived up to all all of the hype. Because I know that there was so many eyes on it. And 
It, it, I mean, it's everybody's been looking forward to it since last year. Yes, <laughs> it's a rare. I mean, it's a. Re- it used to be a regular thing in college basketball. That's why we loved college basketball. Is the rivalries and the same players would be in the same schools year after year after year. But we don't have that in the no. men's game. But now we do have those storylines in the women's game. So everybody's been waiting for this for an entire year now. So I was just hoping that it lived up to the hype. And I thought at least for a, at least. A game and a half, like in the first half, and then half of the second half, it did live up to the hype. I thought it. I thought the first three quarters were very good. Yeah, and uh, the opening quarter was insane. I'm watching, this going, this is the fastest paced women's basketball game I've ever seen. Even the announcer was like, they got to slow down and start right. walking for a second. <laughs> this pace is frenetic. It was crazy. So, what was this? Did we have a seven? What do you have? Seventy five points in the first quarter, and they're playing ten minute quarters. Right. It was unbelievable. And I'm watching this thinking to myself, through most of the game, the end of the game was was kind of a letdown. Just, you know, it all just it just turned into fouling and free throws. Yeah. And, you know, I hate I hate how basketball ends that way. But I'm thinking to myself, I tweeted this. If you if you're watching LSU, Iowa. And you're not enjoying this, then you just don't like basketball. Exactly. You don't like the game of basketball. It had so many of the things that we love about sports and basketball in Iowa LSU. Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese. And and if you if you are the sort of person that just doesn't like women's basketball, then I feel like you haven't watched it lately. And maybe I'm wrong. I'm gonna ask Lindsay Whalen this when she comes on at four o'clock. This game has changed. Yeah. It just wasn't this way. I just think Max. I just think the. I think the women's game has vaulted in ten years. It is so much faster, so much more athletic. It's so much more vertical now than it used to be. We don't have dunks. Yeah, but we still have the verticality is there in a way that it didn't used to be. Blocked shots, uh, power forwards. Uh, it's. I just think the game has gotten so much better. And the personalities have room to shine a lot more, I would say, in today's game. They certainly have a platform for it, right? Yeah. I mean, look at Caitlin Clark. I go into High V. Caitlin Clark is everywhere in High V. <laughs> now, granted, that's a Des Moines based company. And, you know, she's already now Iowa legend. Yeah. I don't I don't know what the list of Iowa legends are. <laughs> it can't be that long. I don't think it is that long. But Caitlin Clark's already on the Mount Rushmore, right? So she has to be. Who I who are the most famous people from Iowa? Feel free to Google that for a second. Clark versus Reese was the kind of rival we just don't see. And, and Max alluded to this in men's hoop because great players leave so early. You know, we've we've wanted to see the rematch. Angel Reese after the win last year garnered all kinds of controversy when she was pointing to her fi- her ring finger in the face of Caitlin Clark. Um, some loved it, some hated it. I thought it was a little classless when you're the winner to do that, and that le- that leaned me towards Caitlin Clark getting revenge in this game. That's where my rooting interest was. And here comes Clark into the game, leading college basketball in points and assists. Who does that? I mean, it's like Chamberlain level success. I mean, points uh, and and assists. And she's she's shooting from. I mean, Steph Curry range. She's really regularly is. pulling up from the logo. It's just it just has brought a whole different level of excitement to the game that wasn't there before. So, has there ever been a woman marksman, at least at the college level, anywhere close to Kate, Caitlin Clark? And I don't know because I just this isn't this is not my my area of expertise has there ever been and maybe other people do know in fact you can you can participate the Bradshaw and Bryant KFN text line 64686 for those that might be interested uh you can also email in the Bradshaw and Bryant uh inbox also available uh by the way we're, we're being told uh John Wayne from Iowa John Wayne is from Iowa Johnny Carson is also oh, from Iowa yeah, that's they got, huge yeah they got some heavy hitters that actually. Is, that is <laughs> yeah, heavy hitters. Yeah. we uh, underestimated Iowa's game uh, Aston Kutcher uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, texters. Kurt, does Kurt Warner count? Kurt Warner, I guess, counts. It counts. He's Do in fictional the Hall characters fame. count? Because Captain Kirk is from <laughs> Iowa. So that is that's, true. I mean. Radar O'Reilly. <laughs> what, do you know who Radar O'Reilly is? Is that a mash? That's thing? right. Nicely done. Okay, there we go. Nicely done. Um, she feels like, Kaylin Clark, as you mentioned, feels like a female Steph Curry. 
And I, you wonder if, and people do this all the time, and it, it's probably not fair to anybody involved, but you wonder if Caitlin Clark couldn't be an, an NBA level, just three point role player because right. the accuracy is, is, is so good. I mean, we saw that from Sabrina Ionescu during the All Star weekend. She, she scored as many as the men did in the actual three point contest and just barely came up short against Steph Curry. I mean, pretty much at this point, inarguably the greatest shooter of all time. The passing from Caitlin Clark, Max, it's nuts. Now, and it, it, it all goes back to really, I think, it's, I think it's vision as much as anything else. She sees the court and sees the plays developing. And when she's throwing down some of these crazy passes, you're, you never, I never saw it coming. No, me neither. I watched plenty of basketball. <laughs> I, she's throwing down passes I did not see coming. And I'm, I'm like, how did she know to do that? Some of the passes were errant, but they were bold. They were aggressive. And I loved it. And Clark obviously ends up prevailing. 41 points, 12 assists, 7 rebounds, 9 three-pointers. <laughs> and not at the stripe three-pointers, right? Yeah. She went over her Vegas line on all of those stats, by the way. Wow. If you'd have parlayed her points, assists, rebounds, and threes over, that would have been a huge ticket. Whew. Caitlin Clark has now set the all-time career tournament assist record. She has set the all-time three-point make record. And th- she's only 38 points of setting the career all-time tournament points record. She's currently at 400 tournament points. She's going to oh get God. 38, if assuming they can win this next game against UConn right. in an epic matchup with Paige Beckers. Then she'll get the thirty-eight points. It's just if it, it, can she can she play can she do it in one game or does she need to? That's that's the real question because it's going to get broken. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and more to her passing again because when you see a volume scorer like her, usually you would think like, oh, they're just double teaming her and she's throwing it open to a wide open person. That's not the case at all. Like she has just absolute astonishing court vision, like you said. It is amazing. Ab- unlike. You know, unlike male players, female players, any of that. Uh, Angel Reese was great until she hurt her ankle. Yeah. Uh, Roughly what? End of the first quarter. She already had like 10 points in the first quarter. She had, I don't know, like five rebounds. Several blocks. Yes. (laughs) Right. Multiple blocks. And I, I tweeted this, and at the time it was true. Right. And I tweeted this right before the injury. She had put Caitlin Clark into a bad spell. Uh, a series of bad possessions. And there was a time where it really looked like Angel Reese was in Caitlin Clark's head. But then the injury happened. She left the game. She came back. And she didn't wasn't like dragging a leg behind her, but the whole, her whole game was off. Yeah, the was scoring the went way down. Yeah, the shooting percentage went way down. Everything went down when Angel Reese wasn't the same after that ankle injury. And she ultimately followed out with two minutes to go, although the game was effectively over by then anyway. Angel Reese, by the way, she's got senior year eligibility left. Unlike Caitlin, Caitlin Clark, who's already announced that she's not coming back, Angel Reese could. I think she will. I think she. I think because she lost, she might. Yeah. If she'd have won back to back, I think she'd. I think, I think she she'd probably be, yeah, hang it up right? right off into the sunset. Mm-hmm. And also, I think just the NIL money's rolling in. Why? Why? Why be in a rush to go to the WNBA? Well, I, isn't that true for anybody? I mean, Caitlin Clark, same yeah. thing. You almost wonder if she can't make more money where she is now as a fixture of the Iowa Hawkeyes instead of a fixture for, I don't know what team's picking first in the WNBA draft. Do you I think happen it's to know? The Indiana Fever. Okay, then the Indiana Fever. Isn't she a more valuable marketing tool wearing Hawkeyes than wearing Fever? You would think so. So I'm, I bet she, I, is she eligible to come back? Maybe she just wants to, she's done it all, seen it all, wants to take her game. She's one of those people that's a hardcore competitor. She's, mm-hmm. I mean, everybody's thinking about the money, but she's not thinking about the money. She wants, she wants to prove people to people that she's the GOAT. She's one of those like Kobe mama mentality kind of players. So now she gets UConn and Paige Becker. So if, if Caitlin Clark wins that matchup, against one of the all-time great coaches and programs in the history of women's basketball and Paige Beckers takes her down and then presumably 
faces an undefeated South Carolina team and beats that team? <sighs> Max, I mean, we're going to be talking one of the great playoff runs in the history of basketball. I mean, we're talking like three years from now that some young actress is going to win an Oscar for playing Caitlin Clark in the movie because that, that's you can't write a script better than that. You really can't. You can't. <laughs> no. And we might very well be looking at that. Right now, South Carolina is the betting line favorite to win the, to win the whole title of the four remaining teams. I was second. And I was favored in this next game. It's going to be fascinating. I can't wait to watch. It's going to be fascinating. They go to Cleveland. Uh, what is the what day is the next uh, the next round? I believe it's Saturday. Let me double check. Thank you. Mentioned that um, Caitlin Clark's got her high V endorsement and many others. Um, my, you know, I saw there were a lot of ads that were running that had Caitlin Clark in it. Friday. Friday. Thank you very much. Yeah, because they don't want to run. They don't run women's the same day as men's. Right? Oh, yeah, that's so right. They, I was yeah. thinking of the men's. That's on yeah. Saturday, I believe. Yeah. Um, I think I think Caitlin Clark is just a phenomenal endorser target because she's and I want to I want to make sure that I, I I phrase this correctly. Caitlin Clark embodies what you want to be associated with your brand. She is the best at what she does. She's a she's incredibly competitive. Yeah. Um, there, it doesn't feel like there's any fraud with Caitlin Clark of any kind. It all feels 100% legit. Um, I just think, I just, I, and maybe it's just because we're in the Midwest. She's from the Midwest, the homegrown story. UConn didn't want her, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I just think she's just, they're so, it's so easy to root for Caitlin Clark. It I, feels like I couldn't way. agree more. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm very confused and baffled by people that are haters of her. I just, I love seeing that level of competitor. And why, I mean, unless you have a rooted interest, unless you're, you know, a, 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 a fan of another Big Ten women's basketball team, yeah. why do you, why do you care? Let's all just watch this greatness and have fun watching it. Well, and that's part of what you were talking about before. If you watch this game, how could you not have fun? Right. It's, you know, it's everything we love about sports in one thing. Is it as good as as good as the men's or the NBA? Because I got this all over my timeline. It's not, you know, they they can't they can't hang with the men. Doesn't matter. Don't care. Yeah, it's at, still fun at their level. It's awesome competition, and it's all the things we love about sports: the storylines, the the competitiveness, the back and forth. It was it was everything that we love. Let's uh, let's try to stay relatively on track with our breaks, Max. Um, when we come back, I do want to talk about the women's game getting objectively, provably better over time. And I think that, I think that is absolutely, absolutely a fact. And, but I don't know enough to know for sure. Cause just honestly, I've right. been somebody who watches two links games a year once in a while, I'd watch a, a women's Gophers game, but I just I don't have. If w Lindsey Whalen wasn't playing in it, basically I wasn't watching. <laughs> right. And if Lindsey was, then there was a chance I was watching. Um, and so I don't have the depth of knowledge that some people do. But I'm going to make my case for the the women's game being a lot, a lot better than it used to be when we come back. <laughs> Some 41 head to Minneapolis on their tour of the Setting Some Farewell Tour Tuesday, April 23rd. Don't miss seeing them one last time as they take the stage at the Armory with special guests, the Interrupters. Tickets are on sale now. Get yours today at KFN.com keyword calendar. Welcome back, Paul Charchi, and in for Dan today. We've been talking about the Caitlin Clark Angel Reese uh, Iowa LSU game, also UConn USC. Uh, USC had big bodied women, and I thought early on, I thought USC was just going to overpower UConn with their size. Yeah. And then Paige Becker says so she just hammered away 
at USC over time, even though USC's got this freshman who apparently is going to be great, Juju Watkins. Juju Watkins. People are already saying that she could break Caitlin Clark's records. Wouldn't that be amazing? Which is just <laughs> incredible, <laughs> right? <laughs> we're thinking we're watching the greatest college player right. of all time, and we might already have her successor. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, UConn, very shorthanded with injuries, a storyline that I think most people, if you've been following this at all, are, are very familiar with. And Beckers has played every minute of the last three Huskies games. Dear God. Every minute. <sighs> Uh, she ends up she ends up with 28 points um, and a very good effort, even though after a relatively slow start uh, for Paige. And now we get the uh, the big rematch. Uh, you may have heard the game last night on the fan carried here, uh, which is great. Uh, we love it when you have the opportunity to get uh, some of the big tent pole games on the fan. I should also mention Gophers women. NIT, final four bound for the NIT. Oh, let's go. Yeah, I didn't even go. realize. Yeah. Oh, my God. How about that? That's pretty sweet. Still alive in the NIT. Fantastic. Um, women's basketball, has it gotten better? I tweeted this because I, I openly admit it. Look, I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on this. How much better has it gotten? Virtually everybody that answered my tweet, all of them saying, the game has gotten so much better. Objectively, provably better. Better athletes. Faster pace. I mentioned more vertical, even without the dunks. More physical as well, which I like. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of the women's basketball when I was growing up and younger from years ago was a lot of pass, 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 shoot. Pass, 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 shoot. And this is a game that is much more stylistically closer to men's basketball, which frankly is what I want to see. I want a more, I want a faster paced game. I want a more physical game. I want to see Iowa's inside beef. <laughs> Kate Martin and Sydney, a faller. I want to see them battling. Angel Reese and who was the other girl? Um, Morrow. Oh, Morrow. Yes, yeah, she was a beast. She is. <laughs> I want to see. I want to see them banging in the key. Now, a lot of people say, and again, it's not as good as the men's game. And overall, it's probably not as good, I guess, objectively as the men's game. But that, in some moments and in some games, it's better than the men's game. And at the end of the day, it only matters if it's entertaining. And it was really re the games last night were entertaining by any by I think any uh, anybody's any fans judgment. Now, some people are like, well, you're virtue signaling when you talk about I'm getting this and I'm getting this in the Twitter and I got this. I, I'm getting this in the in, uh, in the text line, the Bradshaw and Brian text line virtue signaling because I'm having fun watching women's hoops. Like, come on, man. You know, really? <laughs> come on, man. You know, can a great game just be a great game? <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't, I what? don't think, I don't think that that's the case. I mean, people act like if you're, if you're enjoying women's sports, that somehow that that detracts or diminishes from the men's game. Not at all. I mean, this is just all additive. We love sports. Right. We love the drama. We love the personalities. And I couldn't find the, the, the viewership statistics for last night's game, but it said the game before that, almost 7 million people wow. watched Caitlin Clark yes. in, in the Sweet 16. So 7 million people are all virtual signaling, <laughs> signaling right. or do we like the game? Like, come on, Maybe man. That's we ridiculous. just like the game. Now, Max, do you think that Angel Reese, Paige Beckers, and Caitlin Clark, when they go to the WNBA, do you think the WNBA will get a lift like college basketball has from them. I do think so. And I think in general, just the, the general interest in women's sports is steadily increasing. And the exposure that we all have to women's sports was good because before you had to have ESPN 8, the Ocho, to watch any That's right. women's yes. sporting event. And now it's becoming more uh, prolific, more ubiqu ubiquitous. So I, think, I do think they're going to get a boost because we've never... 
I mean, we've seen obviously tons of great players come in and out of the WNBA, but in the social media age, this is a whole different type of, I mean, this is a phenomenon what Caitlin Clark has going on around her. She's kind of like the Taylor Swift of yeah. well, college basketball right now. It's, it's a whole phenomenon. She's a role model. She's opening up whole brand new avenues. Same with Angel Reese. And that whole rivalry mm -hmm. has just sparked a, a, a brand new interest in women's basketball that wasn't there before. And, and then, of course, Paige Beckers as well. She was kind of Caitlin Clark before Caitlin Clark. And then she had the injury. And now she's back reminding people why the hype was around her in the first place. So when Reese, Beckers, and Clark will go to the WNBA, and it'll happen within a, a frame of two years. You would think that the WNBA would get a big lift, but let's remember, we've had great WNBA players yeah. in the past, and big names. Cheryl Miller, Cheryl Swoops, Diane Taurasi, Lisa Leslie, Cynthia Cooper, Maya Moore, Sylvia Fowles, Lindsay Whalen, yeah. who will be on at 4 o'clock. We've had other great female WNBA players that have helped the league but have not brought it to stardom in really the ways that we're seeing college basketball right now. So I don't know that it's guaranteed. I hope it is. I, I hope that it does come along. I hope so, too. And just in general, like you said, the, the game itself is more entertaining to watch, or it's entertaining to watch, period. I can't speak to if it was, how entertaining it was in the past, but it's entertaining to watch right now. So along with the personalities mm -hmm. and along with the competitiveness in general, you got you know Kelsey Plum, Aja Wilson, all, Candace Parker, all these people that are great athletes right now in the WNBA that Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, and Paige Beckers are all going to face up against, and it's really exciting. Uh, last thing, and then we'll uh, we'll go to Thor Nice and do some NFL draft talk for uh, for a segment. Women's sports, Max, has to earn every fan, every viewer, all of them earned. You know, like the, the, the NFL, the rattiest, crappiest Thursday night game still draws, you know, 30 million <laughs> viewers, right. right? And the next morning, we're breaking it down on the Friday football <laughs> feast, even though it was an awful game. Right. Between two teams that have been eliminated for two months from playoff contention. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The women's sports has to earn everything they get, and the payoff was last night. Thor Nystrom, some draft talk when we come back. Man. Want to chime in on what's happening with your favorite KFM program? Make your voice heard on the Bradshaw and Brian text line. Let us know what you have to say by texting your message to 64686. That's 64686. Standard message and data rates apply. Charchi and in for Dan Barrero today. Time to talk Vikings draft. Uh, draft is at this point, I don't know, what are we, a three and a half weeks away, I believe? Three and a half weeks away. Not even, barely half. Let's call it a little over three uh, weeks away. And then the Vikings will will finally, after now months of wondering what the Vikings will do, we'll have have our answers. Our our draft expert, and you've already been on, Thor Nystrom's already been on, been on with myself, uh, PA, and Nordo, Friday Football Feast. We talked about a lot of J.J. McCarthy. Uh, hey, Thor, welcome back to the show. How you doing, Church? Good. Nice to talk to you again. Been, it's been a little while. We haven't caught up lately. Do you, um, a lot of the rest of the world is caught up to your early J.J. McCarthy steam. I'm now seeing him mocked to... The Giants at six. I doubt there are some people who think he's going to go as early as two, pick two, pick three, pick six, pick seven, uh, Tennessee. Right now, where do you think J.J. McCarthy is going to go if there are no, and there almost certainly will be some trades, but if there aren't, where do you, where do you see J.J. McCarthy going at this point as we're three weeks out from the draft? I'm going to slightly cop out and say top five. I, I do not think he gets down to the Giants pick. But to your point, Charge, you know, we come into this draft process. Drake may, as you know, is the prohibitive favorite to go number two overall to Washington. At this point, the odds boards have changed so emphatically that it's a three-horse race as yeah. depicted by those, those that odds board for, to be the quarterback at that pick between Jaden Daniels, Drake May, and now J.J. McCarthy. There's been uh, rumors that New England might like McCarthy as well. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, if, if he gets to the four and five slot, you're going to have the, the trade-up possibility. But I, I would doubt that he falls down to the Giants. It's just hard to ascertain which slot he's going to go in, two, three, four, five. 
Yeah, but you think some quarterback needy team will make a move to get up above the Giants to get that fourth quarterback? I do, because the, the Giants are a real incredible threat to take that fourth quarterback. And so I think that you would have to get above them in order to secure that fourth guy off the board, assuming it goes one, two, three quarterbacks. Yeah. And do you think it will? Do you do you think it's going to Williams, Daniels, and then quarterback? Either May or McCarthy? I do. Yeah, I, I, I do. And then I, I think that's where you have the race to get to four and five. I, I thought the, the comments from Sean Payton at the owners meeting was super interesting when they asked him, like, about the trade up possibility. And, you know, can we assume that you're one of the teams that's looking to trade up? And, and he was like, oh, yeah, you can definitely assume <laughs> that. So, so we know that their hats in the ring, obviously, the Vikings are as well. So you're going to have competition. I think there's some flawed thinking around Vikings fans, Thor, that. New England wants to move out of three. And I, the reason I think it's flawed thinking is because New England, it's, they desperately need a quarterback. And you don't, no team thinks to themselves, yeah, we're going to be in the top three again next year. You know, most teams, even if you are likely to, most teams don't believe that and don't want to believe that that's the case, Thor. And where I see, where Viking fans seem to be pinning a lot of hope is that they can put throw such a big package at New England that New England will say, all right, we're going to throw in the towel on the 2024 season and our potential quarterback of the future. We're going to punt that forward, put a lot of other draft picks towards our teams uh, for uh, for future years and hope that we can find a quarterback in a future draft. That's a huge gamble by by New England if they end up making that move. Do you believe New England sticks at three or do you think they move? I think the way that they've set this up, and I think Robert, speaking of the owners' meetings, I think he stated this explicitly. I think what New England is setting up is if if someone will come forward and beat the offer that the Texans gave to Arizona for last year's uh, number three pick, like if you thought that was a, a, a good value on a trade, we want more than that. And if someone will come forward and beat that offer, we will consider it. I think they've been very explicit with Robert Kraft said the same thing. They, they asked him about the possibility of trading down. And, he, and his exact quote was, if I put my fan hat on, I can understand, you know, just sticking and picking and not thinking about it, taking that quarterback. But, you know, based on the what we've been hearing and the different offers and different stuff like that, if, if it is an offer that is sufficient to move down, if we get the King's ransom, that they will then very much consider that. I think that is the only way. I think it is going to take an absolutely enormous, perhaps cost prohibitive trade offer in order to get them to move out. But yeah, I do think that they're going to listen and consider if they get one of those. For right. sure. So let's assume Quasey doesn't want to make an outrageous offer uh, that it might take to get New England uh, to punt on this coming season and, and potentially a franchise quarterback at three. And let's assume the Vikings are picking at 11 and the Vikings are picking at 23. What does the team do, assuming one of the big four quarterbacks in this this draft are gone at 11, which I think is very likely, and, and you do too, what do you think this team does at 11 and 23? I think that 23rd pick is going to would probably be used on a, a quarterback, perhaps not in that slot. Mm-hmm. Uh, perhaps you trade back a little bit uh, at the very end of the first round or maybe even at the beginning of the second. And then that's where you use that guy. I'm not sure. I, I know that they put it out there and said, oh, we could ride forward with Darnold and then, you know, Mullins and, and Jaron Hall. I, I think there might be a ride in Minneapolis if, if they if that's how they intend to have the quarterback depth chart next year. They, you know, not necessarily that you have to trade all the way up for, for that, but like if there's not any rookie quarterback brought in with all the draft equity that they have, I, I think the fan base would really be scratching their heads and, and upset at, at that point. So I would assume that, and, and, and I think that they put this out there as well of like, you know, there's not only four quarterbacks that we like in this class and that we've looked into. And, and if, if, if there's not that possibility of moving up, we have this, this different draft equity that we have accrued in this class where then we could, we could go out and figure something else out. Would that be Michael Penix? I find it interesting that the brother of the Vikings quarterback coach seems to be Michael Penix's biggest fan in the world. Oh. Uh, the, the, M- McCown's brother, he's tweeting about Michael Penix like every other day. Really? Okay. Uh, you know, but of course, the, you know, Josh was the coach of Drake May, of course. But like, would, would Penix be of interest? Penix definitely tested well at his pro day uh, 
blew people up, blew expectations out of the water for what his athletic profile was. Sort of harkened back to his early days at Indiana when he was a dual threat guy. Some people thought that athleticism had depreciated a bit because of the four season ending injuries that he had consecutively. The, the one thing that I wonder about, Penix has all the arm ability that you want. My one question about him, in, you know, under this scenario that potentially he'd be a late first round pick or mm-hmm. an early second round pick of the Vikings that you would bring in and then could immediately compete with, with Sam Darnold. I've always wondered about the fit of him in KOC's offense. Uh, Penix is really good when you give him that clean pocket. He can step into throws and his feet are set on the ground. He has that mm-hmm. solid throwing platform under him. His accuracy begins to plummet the more his, his feet are moving and the more he is pushed off his spot. When his feet are shuffling, he lo- loses something like 10% off his completion percentage, loses another 10 to 15 when he is outright on the move scrambling. The other and probably bigger, more topical one to the KOC offense is Michael Penix didn't throw over the field, the middle of the field a ton in that intermediate sector that KOC loves to attack. Does that mean he can't do it? No, he certainly has the RPMs in his arm. But the Washington offense w- was not constituted that way. So th- that's one sort of hazy mark about his projection and specifically the fit to the Vikings offense. All right. So let's talk about, let's talk about Penix a little bit more. Let's say the Vikings are, they're up at 23 and they've decided that you know, they have, they've got to come out of this draft with a, with a quarterback. And if they don't take one, if they don't take one at 23, their next pick is, I believe, 82 picks later, right? So yep. you know, if it's not at 23, or a short move down, then you know the window for a quarterback is going to close. So, if the Vikings were to take Michael Penix at twenty three, is that a reach? I think that that's a reach. Yeah, I, I think it's an objective reach. Now, today, Eric Golko, who who runs the Shrine Game, he went out there. There was an interview with him that was put out on Twitter where he said he thinks there's going to be the four quarterbacks off the board immediately. And he's not sure that there will even be one that goes mm-hmm. the next one, QB5, until day three. Oh, jeez. I'm definitely not going to go. Yes. I'm definitely not going to go that far. Uh, and, and I still think it's in play to potentially get a fifth one at the end of the first round, or maybe even Sean Payton panic overdrafts one of them. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that is a possibility. But if not, I think you get the fifth one off the board pretty quickly on Friday. And if you were heading into that event, if you're Quasi, you're heading in, I think that, that would be the math that you would do on it as well. So, you know, I, I, for me, I would trade down from that spot if, if I was in, in their shoes. But they might think as well, there's other teams lingering around here. If, 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 if he's available at 23 and we do like, you know, let's say it's Michael Penix, they might feel like they have to do that. I, I would find that to be a little bit of a reach. So for, for me, he's more like, you know, late 30s, early 40s is where I'd be more comfortable at the price point. We're talking to Thor Nystrom. You can hear him on Fantasy Football Weekly. We highly encourage you to listen to Fantasy Football Weekly. Uh, the several, three of the last four episodes have been Thor and I breaking down position players, including Michael Penix. Uh, also, everything you ever want to know about J.J. McCarthy, available if you follow <laughs> Thor on Twitter, at Thor KU. You are a Kansas University uh, grad. Um, so, lo- rock, all right, so let's rock chalk. Let, is it chalk or talk? Rock chalk. Chalk. Okay. I think that's chalk. Let's assume the Vikings hold at 11. And what what would be the pick for Minnesota at 11 if they haven't made the trade up for a quarterback? What are they doing? I think you go BPA for an infrastructure position at that point. Uh, whether that would be one of these really good tackle prospects who would step in immediately at one of the guard spots Right, and then give you the versatility potentially if you have an injury at tackle, mm-hmm. which th- this isn't pie in the sky. We've, the Vikings have had that, the injuries at tackle the last couple of years. Potentially he could then kick out. But you could put him, you know, uh, let's say Fuaga or Fatanu from Washington or a couple guys that have the tackle projection play tackling in college, but certainly uh, have the projection and the tools and the game to project them to be extremely good uh, NFL starting guards and immediately. So th- 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 those would be options, very deep tackle class, or I would go uh, defensive, the defensive front, you know, be yeah. that the interior defensive lineman or be that the edge rusher. And then I think that, you know, the sort of the fallback option would, would be a cornerback. And, and because of these position groupings, you would have an option there to potentially move back a little bit. You know, you mentioned before, Charge, the, the, the long wait you're going to have to do after that second first round pick yeah. until you're able to pick again. You know, obviously the, the Vikings had traded the second and the Houston trade traded the third rounder previously. So you, you're sitting with no day two picks in this scenario that we're talking about. 
I think it would be very attractive to Kwesi to parlay whether that's that 11th pick or whether it's that second one in the first into picking up a day two pick. But if they just stick at 11, I would think best available between uh, an offensive uh, a lineman that is able to step in immediately at guard. Then uh, Brendel and Ingram, they can fight it out at the other one. Plus, you have good depth now as well at, on the interior, which has been a while since we've been able to say that. Or you go with the, the defensive interior lineman or the edge rusher. You know, be that law too. Be you know Turner uh, falling down. Uh, Jared Verse very mm-hmm. well could be available there. Um, and then we have the two interior defensive linemen who I think deserve to be taken in the first round. Maybe they'd be more like guys in the teens if you could trade down a little bit. But between Byron Murphy and then Johnny Newton of Illinois. If if the I, I think the Vikings would go D end at eleven. Um, and by the way, they could get one of the they could get like the second D end off the board at eleven. You know, Dallas Turner probably right. goes first. Uh, before them, yeah. Uh, but there's a chance they could get their pick of the litter. I mean, there's, you know, they might all be there at 11. And then I think at 23, if the Vikings don't, they don't solve quarterback here in the first round, then I think they go cornerback because there are a lot of good cornerbacks that would be there at 23 potentially. Clemson's Nate Wiggins, Iowa's got uh, Cooper DeJean, uh, Alabama's got Kool Aid McKinstry. Many people thought it was going to go like top 10 at this time last year. So there are some options at cornerback, and the Vikings basically don't even have a, a legitimate starting cornerback right now, like an NFL caliber starter at that position. So I think, I think D end and cornerback would solve the big, it would be the need based picks at 11 and 23. Definitely. And at that point, you say you get to 11, there's a decent shot that no cornerback has gone off the board at that point, right? Correct. Like most of the mocks you look at, it's, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in there when you get the first one off the board. Quinion Mitchell, I think, would be a pretty good fit. Uh, fortified kid, uh, 98 percentile uh, athlete, and a guy that they wouldn't throw at in college at the end there mm-hmm. when, when they were in the MAC. It's like, yeah, that side of the field is south limits. We're not throwing at Quinion. But then, you know, later in the first round, you know, between Kool Aid, between Cooper DeJean, a guy that could move all over the place, what could be a chess piece that uh, Brian Flores is attracted to, a guy that could play the slot play him on the boundary. There's been talk of, you know, a center fielder be good there, potentially. He also, they would put him in the box when Iowa wanted to stack up the box. Cooper DeJean not only is good in run defense in, in terms of that, like he does not mind scrapping. You can also send him after the quarterback. So that could be another guy that, that they are considering. But I totally agree with you, Charge. They are, they need at least one standout uh, for sure starting cornerback mm-hmm. before you could start to even start to feel good about that cornerback room. They, they have one of the, the league's worst cornerback rooms right now by any objective measure. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you, you, you mentioned how the, the team, the Vikings could have potentially at 11, their pick of edge rushers or their pick of cornerbacks either way, because most people believe like nine of the first 10 picks are going to be offense. Talk to me about the offensive orientation of the top of this draft. Yeah, 1,000%. You, you have the four quarterbacks that we've been talking about. Then you have the three stud receivers. This is an awesome receiver class. You have mm-hmm. the, the three ones at the top. Those guys have to go in the top 10. Joe Alt has to go in the top 10. Joe Alt is tackle. at the, you know, tier one of by himself in this awesome offensive tackle class. He starts that, and then Brock Bowers, right, like, has become an extremely popular pick at number 10 mm-hmm. ever since the Jets fortified their offensive line. And there was an interesting uh, quote by their GM saying that they had you know, solved the offensive line or fixed it or whatever. So the thought being, maybe they defer that pick to another position, then that that would be Brock Bowers. So there is this possibility of only, let's say, one defender in the top 10. That is the scenario. Like, let's say that the three wide receivers go before Chicago's pick. Mm -hmm. Chicago almost assuredly defers then to taking the first edge rusher off the board, which then by the time the Vikings come up, I would assume the Jets in this scenario are either going to go offensive line or else take Brock Bowers. The Vikings then would have their pick of the second defender off the board, yeah. right? Like if, if, if you know if this is the way that it is. So at that point, you can decide. Let, let's say Dallas Turner is the guy that Chicago took with their second with Chicago's second first round pick. The Vikings then you can decide. Jared Verse, I, I think, is a very good fit in this mm-hmm. offense. That is a north south locomotive with strength in his hands, just coming forward, the attacking guy who also can set the edge in the run and occupy and allow those linebackers in the three, four system. You know, they they love to have them flowing around to the ball sideline to sideline. And you also need to hold the containment 
on, on, on the edge here versus the guy that's going to do that. He would be very attractive. Quinion Mitchell, I think, would be very attractive as well. Those would probably be the two guys that, that would sort of lead the, the dance for me. But, I mean, only one guy off the board. You'd have plenty of options. Yeah, you'd have plenty. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. A, a ton of options. All right, just back to quarterback for one last thing with Thor Nystrom. You can follow him on Twitter, at ThorKU. I believe, and it sounds like you do too, I've heard so many people think that have told me the Giants and the Titans are not teams that are going to take a quarterback. I totally disagree. I think I think the Giants know that the, and you know, yes, they've got Daniel Jones under a big contract, but really they only have to hold him one more year and then his contract becomes something they can, uh, they can get out of without much salary cap ramifications at all. And Will Levis looked bad for most of last year. I mean, tons of arm talent, I get it, but so many problems with Will Levis. No way am I, if I'm the Titans, do I feel like I can stand pat at the quarterback position? I really believe if you want one of those four guys, you've got to jump ahead of the Titans and the Giants, and it sounds like you're on the same page. Yeah, I I am, and one other contextual thing for people out there with regards to the Giants, Church is totally right with the way he's setting that up. Daniel Jones has that enormous amount of guaranteed money for this coming season, but after it, that's when the Giants can move on. So one year from now in that off season, but there's something that there's, there's a contingency in there. If Daniel Jones is injured at that time, they can't release him. Then his, his next year becomes, uh, you know, close to or fully guaranteed as well, where then it would become almost impossible to get out of him next off season. So the Giants, they cannot release him, uh, Daniel Jones, right now because of you, you would have to pay him way more in dead cap hit even than his regular salary cap is, is for this season. So you have to carry him on the roster for this season. But the Gi- here's the important point. The Giants have every incentive in the world to do with Daniel Jones this regular season what the Denver Broncos yep. did to Russell Wilson at the end of last off, at the end of last season. It was the exact same thing. Russell Wilson's contract, he would get more guarantees if he happened to be injured past certain dates mm-hmm. where, they, where then the, the Broncos wouldn't be able to move on from him. The Giants do not want to be stuck in that situation. If you take the rookie quarterback, you're sort of killing two birds with one stone where, where the current administration, then they can, they can go to the fan base and say, Hey, we're, we're bringing in this guy. And, and this is, who we're going to pin the future hopes of the franchise to. But then in addition, you were able then to sit Daniel Jones on the bench, not let him get anywhere near the field where he could potentially get injured. And then you have to carry him going forward. All great, all great observations. And you're exactly right. It's the Russell Wilson situation all over again. Uh, you can hear Thor and fantasy football weekly, uh, many weeks, including the current episode of fantasy football weekly. And you can follow Thor on Twitter. Thank you, my man. Appreciate you, Charge. Great talking to you. That's uh, Thor Nystrom. When we come back, Hall of Famer Lindsey Whalen joins. We'll, uh, we'll talk about last night's uh, two epic games. We'll uh, preview the, the forthcoming game. Uh, get her thoughts on the state of women's basketball as well. Lindsay Whalen coming up next on The Fan.